We're in the midst of working through the pure exchange model of trade between two individuals, and we use this particular diagram to demonstrate how trade would be a win-win situation for two individual traders. Two people come together in a market, exchange apples for oranges, under the assumption that more is better and there's diminishing marginal utility. We drew this particular diagram in Edgeworth Box, and imagine that Smith and Jones would be able to trade from a point like E to a mutually beneficial point like H or somewhere in the middle, which would increase their utilities simultaneously. They would both gain as a result from trade. Now today what we're going to do is we're going to continue and, and I want to talk a little bit about the underlying ethical principles that are embedded in this model. But also we're then going to expand the model to include production and introduce the concepts of comparative advantage and how specialization in trade can actually expand the production possibilities of a simple two-person economy like this. I also want to highlight, though, that when we're talking about Smith and Jones as two people coming together in trade, you know, this course is about international trade, and we could just as easily apply this to two different countries who are coming together and trading one good for another. In the context of two countries coming together, the results should be very similar to what we're displaying here. If the trades are mutually voluntary and with good information provided, then trades should turn out to be a win-win situation. Both sides benefit from trade, both countries are better off, and trade is a win-win kind of a situation. Okay, but remember the last thing we did in class last time? It was talked about the fact that if Smith and Jones wanted to maximize their utility, they would have to satisfy some conditions. They would have to end up trading to a Pareto optimal point along the green line here. And they would have to satisfy the marginal conditions that the terms of trade, PO over PA, would be equal to the marginal rate of substitution. All of this is a complicated story, if you will, to tell how we might get to a final equilibrium point at a point like S in the middle of this. But what we mentioned at the end was that Smith and Jones are assumed to maximize their utility and they move to a point like S, but it's really not the maximum utility that Smith or Jones could conceivably obtain in this situation where there are 10 apples and 10 oranges to be consumed. Because we saw that Smith, going back to the simpler diagram now, and less scary, Smith would really best be in best position if he could somehow acquire all of the apples and all of the oranges and consume at a point like K. Jones would just assume to have all the apples and oranges and consume at a point like A over here. And when we make the assumptions about trade, we are making assumptions that there is mutually voluntary trades taking place and we're eliminating certain types of behavior that we should well recognize and understand. So I want to highlight that a little bit. I'm going to move to some slides for a moment. So let's talk about the ethical presuppositions or the assumptions we're making that generates mutually advantageous trade in the pure exchange model. The first thing I want to highlight is that there's a necessity for self-interest. Self-interest is absolutely needed for both Smith and Jones to have the desire to come to the market and actually trade apples for oranges to their individual um, improvement or benefit. If, for example, Suppose Smith is self-interested. He cares only about his own individual well-being. But suppose Jones has a different kind of a belief system. Suppose Jones has been taught by his family time and time again to remain self-sufficient, that you can't rely on other people or shouldn't rely on other people, and that you should only produce what's good for yourself. So Smith or Jones might care about self-interest, might want to be is motivated by having more of both goods, but he's going to be a little bit tentative and maybe not even be willing to engage in trade if Smith comes to him and says, tell you what, give you apples for oranges, you'll be better off, I'll be better off, wouldn't that be a great idea? Well, for Jones, Jones is going to hesitate and most likely say, I'm sorry, but that's going to go against my principle of self-sufficiency. So I would rather hold on to my 10 apples and not trade at all rather than engaging in trade. Smith, in turn, would have to go home empty he can consume his 10 oranges and get some utility, but there would not be a trade, there would not be an improvement in surplus, there would not be a win-win situation that occurs. Jones is better off still because he's satisfying his principle of self-sufficiency, of self but Smith needs somebody else on the other side who's going to be 
motivated by self-interest in order for trade to take place. So that's one of the first points to make, kind of an underlying principle that's embedded in this model. We need people to be willing to rely on each other through trade in order for trade to work. Now, we make the assumption of mutually voluntary trade. And what that's ruling out are the scenarios I suggested last time. Why doesn't Smith just come to the market, hit Jones over the head, and walk away with all of his outs? Well, that wouldn't be mutually voluntary, would it? It would involve what we would commonly refer to as theft. And we are, in essence, ruling out the possibility of theft because we're saying the trade has to occur in a mutually voluntary way. We are also implicitly assuming, then, in this model, that there's a respect for property that individuals coming to the market with apples and oranges, that that is theirs to have for themselves, and only if they're willing to engage in trade and give up apples for oranges, only then will the trade occur, and then people can go on their way with their apples and oranges safely and secure in the knowledge that they will have the ability to consume them. You're not going to get robbed on the way that you're there. You're not going to get hit over the head. You're not going to get threatened while you're making a trade, that maybe the terms of trade ought to be different, because if they're not, I'm going to do some harm to you. All of these things we didn't even think of when we first presented the model, but we ought to recognize that we're not allowing for that kind of behavior or activity to take place. And by virtue of that, we are introducing a kind of ethical set of principles here that have to be complied with if win-win outcomes are going to take place. OK, there's some other things we're assuming. We assume in the model that there's perfect information. And the key to this is that we often say that the apples are homogeneous, they're all exactly the same. The oranges are homogeneous, they're all exactly the same. The reason we make that assumption is because we want to presume that Smith and Jones know the quality of the product that they're trading for. That when they go home and they cut into the apples and oranges and begin consuming them, that they get exactly what they expected to get, and therefore the terms of trade that they decided upon was based on full information about the goods they were acquiring. Now, that doesn't always happen in real markets. People are prone sometimes to be deceptive about the products that they're selling. They say they're selling one thing, they're really selling something else. They promise to make a payment to you in the future, the payment doesn't come. Those kinds of things are worrisome, but they can only occur if we don't have perfect information. So perfect information gets rid of that problem, but it also implies a kind of ethical behavior on the other side. It implies that individuals are not deceiving each other, are not willing to deceive each other about the products in question that they're consuming. And when trade takes place over time, whereby I send a payment to somebody, they promise to pay, send me the good later on, I can be assured that promises are going to be kept, that that trade will indeed occur, because if they don't, then it's tantamount to theft, right? You've broken a promise, you've said you're going to give up something you haven't, you kept all the goods for yourself and the money included, and the trade has not been mutually beneficial. So there's a set of principles and ethics that are underlying the market. And we have to presume that those are taking place in order to say that trade is indeed going to be a win-win situation, both sides walking away happy. Now, let's just reflect for a moment about some of the ways that society uses in order to maintain this ethical norm, these ethical norms. We have a whole set of moral codes. You know, I don't think there is any society in the world that doesn't teach their children to be kind to each other, not to hit each other, not to injure each other, that don't teach their children not to steal, not to deceive, to keep your promises. All of these are a part of kind of unwritten moral codes, or in many contexts, in many cultures, a religious code that's been written down, codified, and explained and expressed to people that these are rules that we all ought to follow. Now, people don't always abide by that. They don't always hold up to that. But there are suggestions about what the consequences would be if we don't live up to these particular moral codes. So there's a societal pressure, social pressure, religious pressures that come to bear on individuals 
to try to uphold to these. And what we can now say in the context of our economic model is if people were to adhere to these ethical principles or moral principles, markets would work more effectively. Win-win situations would come about more regularly. Now, we also put up into place lots of private defenses. How do we assure ourselves that our goods that are produced and taken to market are not going to be stolen away from us? Well, we have all sorts of security measures that have been put into place to make sure that our personal belongings and production activities are all kept safe. We put up fences and gates and walls, and we lock things away, and we put safes into place, and we hire security guards, and we do all sorts of things. Why? because we don't want things to be taken away. We want to be able to produce something, bring it to the market, trade it with other people, and enjoy a win-win situation or outcome as a result of that. But private systems are not the only systems that are in place. Right? There are also public defenses against immoral or unethical behavior. We've got local police forces. We've got military to protect the country against invasions or theft by others. We've got laws against violence against theft, against deception in businesses, and we've got a judicial system that's been put into place that can ass assess penalties on individuals who violate these particular rules or norms. Now, it doesn't work perfectly, right? We are constantly fearful, to a degree, of theft of the belongings that we have. We're fearful about being deceived in markets, and we all have probably suffered from those particular occurrences at one time or another in our lives. But it's also remarkable to think about on the other side how often you go to a market safely, you're not afraid of getting there, you're not afraid of getting back, and, rem and remember in some parts of the world that's not always true. You're safely there, you're safely back, you can count on the fact that the goods you have are not going to be taken away from you, you're not going to be coerced in any way, you have good knowledge about the products that you're buying and selling, and you walk away happier as a result of the trades that you made. In most of the trades that we make on a day-to-day, -day, month to month basis, these ethical principles are being adhered to. And as a result, we end up with much, much more win-win outcomes because of that. If you think about societies or countries where these norms are not followed as well, where people are in fear of their lives, where markets um, do not work as well, where deception is the norm rather than an irregularity, markets don't function as effectively. And people have to spend more time and resources on the defenses to try to prevent getting ripped off or getting taken advantage of. So all of that underlies that simple model of exchange between Smith and Jones. I want to finish with just one suggestion. Because there's often some disregard about the basic economic premise that we started with, that self-interest is the motivating force for economic activity, and that this is a good thing. A lot of people look at self-interest, go further and say, well, that's just another word for greed. And greed, we all know, is not something that we should adhere to or follow, right? Greed is bad. And economics seems to be based on greedy behavior on the part of individuals and firms to try to maximize their own individual utility and their own individual profit, and that that's what gets us to good outcomes. Well, we saw the good outcome. Smith and Jones, trading apples and oranges, both becoming better off as a result of that trade. But we have to be aware that it doesn't always work. So when is self-interest, when does it become greed? There's actually a simple way of kind of demarking the boundaries between those two ideas. Self-interest is what we're promoting in economics in the model itself. Individuals are trying to maximize their utility, but subject to a system of ethics that if they adhere to, and if all sides or parties to trade adhere to those particular principles, then we can be assured in most circumstances that both sides are going to walk away with a win, a gain, as a result of the trades that are taking place in marketplaces. So self-interest with ethics is perfectly acceptable, and it's what's being promoted in the standard market model. Self-interest with unethical behavior, if you're willing to deceive others in order to succeed in business, if you're willing to try to take money away from certain people in certain circumstances, if you're going to 
you know, sell them a mortgage for a house that they can't afford and you know they're not going to be able to pay it back, but you're going to get your cut now, even though you know that it's going to be detrimental to them in the future. Well, now you're not practicing ethical behavior and you're not engaging in a win-win situation. And yes, even though you make a lot of money as a result of that activity, you're greedy in that circumstance. You're going beyond the boundaries that the standard market model would allow for because you're acting unethically. So self-interest with unethical behavior is where we get to that it's too much and we've got greed taking place within a particular market or economy. Self-interest with ethics is a win-win situation, but self-interest with greed, I should say greed, is a win-lose. One side is going to benefit, but the other side is going to come up short. And that's not going to promote market efficiency in the end. Okay, with that said, we're going to move on. We're going to expand the market model, the model of exchange that we just talked about with Smith & Jones, and we're going to expand it to incorporate production. In the original model that we talked about, we said Smith & Jones come to the market, Smith with 10 oranges, Jones with 10 apples. Well, now we're going to set them back into their original positions and imagine that they're not just endowed from heaven with some magical amount of goods, but they actually have to go out and produce the goods in question. So we're going to create here and talk about production possibilities for individuals, for Smith and Jones. And again, remember, we can think about this as being one country in another country to talk about it in an international trade context. So here's a simple diagram. We're going to imagine that Smith can work one hour during the day. So one hour a day is his maximum limit of work. I could make it eight hours a day, but then we've got to divide things by eight to figure out numbers. It's a lot easier if I just use the number one. One hour per day is his work uh, effort. And in fact, that's what we're going to endow Smith with, actually. We're going to give him a, an amount of time that he has to produce apples and oranges. Now, on this particular diagram, we're going to imagine that if Smith spent all of his time producing nothing but oranges, one hour spent collecting oranges only, he's going to be able to collect 10 oranges. But if he devotes all of his one hour to collecting apples, he's only going to be able to collect three apples. Now, I recognize these are ridiculous numbers, because I know I could collect on an orange grow, I could collect more than 10 apples and, and oranges in an hour, and certainly more than three apples. The number values don't matter. What matters is just that we have a number to work with and refer to. So the numbers are easy, and we're making it that way. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about this particular line, because this line is what we're going to call the production possibility frontier for Smith under a set of assumptions. And we're going to think really, really hard about defining economic concepts with respect to this particular line. What this line corresponds to is what would happen if Smith split up his time in different combinations, spent a half an hour producing oranges and a half an hour producing apples, for example. How many apples and oranges could he produce? Or spent three-fourths of an hour producing oranges and a quarter hour producing apples. This line is giving us all of the different production possibilities that Jones has in the production of apples and oranges under the assumptions that he can either produce 10 oranges in an hour or three apples in an hour or some combination thereof. All right, let's put some economic um, jargon connected to this, some terminology. We use the term prod, the long variable, a four-letter variable instead of just a P or something like that. So prod, with a superscript S and a subscript O, refers to the productivity of Smith in orange production. Now productivity is an economic concept, and it's simply defined as how much of a good you can produce in a period of time. In the context of this model or example, we're going to measure it in how many oranges you can produce in an hour's worth of work. It corresponds to the end point on his production graph over here, which is now too low for you to see, but you remember it. It's the end point on the orange axis. It's how many oranges he can produce in an hour. Simple. That's his productivity of oranges. Productivity of Smith and apples is the number of apples he can produce in an hour. 
and that's going to correspond to the intercept on the apple axis, three apples per hour. So we can produce three apples per hour. So that's the definition of productivity. Next, we can define a production function in the context of the assumptions we're making in this very simple production model. Let's let QOS represent the quantity of oranges that Smith can produce under different circumstances. And those different circumstances will be giving different amounts of labor, using different amounts of labor in the production of oranges. Now, its quantity of oranges produced is going to be equal to the productivity of orange production by Smith. That value was 10 oranges per hour. Times the number of hours of labor that he devotes to orange production. And we're going to mark that off as L subscript O superscript S. So LOS, this variable, corresponds or represents the amount of labor that Smith is devoting to orange production. It can vary. He can change his mind from day to day how much he's going to devote to that. If he devotes all one hour of labor to the production of oranges and his productivity is 10, tells us he's going to be able to produce 10 oranges. That's how we apply the production function. Just multiply the productivity times the number of labor hours he's using in orange production. QAS, quantity of apples produced by Smith, is the productivity of apples times the amount of labor devoted to apple production, LAS, in hours of time. Now, over here, I'm going to apply the production function for apples, but I'm going to plug in a different amount of labor. So what if his productivity is three apples per hour, and he only applies a half an hour of labor to the production of apples? How many apples can he produce? Well, we just multiply the two numbers together to get 1.5 apples. That corresponds to this point right here. If he devotes half of his time to the production of apples, he's going to be able to produce 1.5 apples. If we plug a half into the production function for oranges, we're going to see that he can produce five oranges. So with those two production functions, we can identify all of the different production possibilities that are going to lie along this particular line. Okay. Wait, there's more. You know, economists have a knack for trying to confuse students, I think, sometimes. And one way we do that is by giving you lots more definitions than we absolutely seem to need sometimes. So I'm going to define another variable that's often used in the context of talking about production and trade, like we're doing here. This variable doesn't have a variable name that corresponds to what we call it. The variable name is A. And A refers to what we call the unit labor requirement. Unit labor requirement, right here. ALO is the unit labor requirement for oranges. ALO superscript S is the unit labor requirement for oranges for Smith. It's got a really simple definition. It's equal to the reciprocal of the productivity. So the productivity for oranges we've defined above. The unit labor requirement is nothing more than the reciprocal. One divided by the productivity. The units of it is also the reciprocal of the units for productivity. Units for productivity is oranges per hour. So the units of the unit labor requirement is hours per orange. In the case of oranges, for this particular example, the number is one-tenth. And we would say that Smith can produce in one-tenth of an hour, he can produce one orange. Now, because the unit labor requirement is just the reciprocal of a variable we've already defined, we might ask, well, why do we need it? And one of the reasons for having this in our lexicon is because economists often like to think about things in terms of cost. How much does it cost us to do something? And this becomes a variable that relates to the cost of producing oranges. How much does it cost Smith to produce an orange? We could answer that in units of labor. We could say it costs him a tenth of an hour to produce one orange. So we've now got a variable that we could use and talk costs about. And that's one of the reasons for introducing this particular variable. I think the second reason is just to keep students confused. <laughs> Define the labor constraint next.
The labor constraint is really simple. We're going to imagine that the labor endowment is the amount of time that we give to Smith to produce apples and oranges. And in our example, we're imagining we give him one hour. But we could give him any number of hours. So L could be a number that we, that we can start with and plug in. We've defined LOS and LAS as the amount of labor devoted to apple and orange production. Well, what would have to be true for Smith is that he takes his hour and he divides it up between apple and orange production in some way, but the summation of the labor time he spends on apple production and orange production has to equal to the total amount of labor time he has. That we call the labor constraint for him in this particular context. So LOS plus LAS has to equal to L. Next, given the number we've got in the example, L is 1. So we can just say LOS plus LAS is equal to 1. Next, we can take L and we can use the production functions that we just defined in the previous slide. And we can plug things into there to get another way to represent this labor constraint. So what I'm doing is saying, remember, the quantity of oranges produced by Smith is equal to the productivity times the amount of labor used in orange production, prod times LOS. But if I rewrite that, I could say that LOS, the amount of labor used in the production of um, um, oranges, is equal to the quantity of oranges produced, whatever that number might be, divided by the productivity. And then lastly, because 1 divided by the productivity is the unit labor requirement, I could write this again as just ALOS, the unit labor requirement for oranges, times the quantity of orange produced, oranges produced by Smith. Now, at some point, like we're in the middle of this, you might wonder, why, why the heck are we doing this? What's, where are we going with it? And you're going to see that later. And this is something economists will do in working with a particular model. You write something down, and you say, ah, what does that mean? I don't know. Let's write it some other way. And we'll see if we can find out what that means. Can we derive some interpretation by kind of playing with the equations and putting them into different forms? So you'll see where we're going in just a minute. Next. Take LOS, which is ALOS times QOS, and plug it into the labor constraint that we've got up here. And we can write this now as ALOS times QOS plus ALAS times QAS has got to be equal to 1. That's another way of writing the labor constraint. But what we've done is we've converted it from writing it in terms of labor inputs to writing it in terms of the outputs of the goods, the quantity of oranges and the quantity of apples produced by Smith. And that's going to allow us to plot this particular thing on a graph with apples and oranges on the axes. That's exactly what we did plot. And so what I just identified for you with this equation is actually the equation of that line. OK, but it's the equation of that line with interpretation, with some economic meaning associated with it. So now, the equation of the line in general is ALO times QO, ALA times QA is equal to L. But if we plug in the values for the unit labor requirement, and we plug in the values for the labor endowment, then we get these particular values. And that equation is exactly the equation of the line with corners 10 and 3 that we started off with at the beginning of the exercise. Next. Jones is another individual. We're going to imagine that Jones can produce apples and oranges, just like Smith. We're going to give Jones the same amount of labor input. The labor endowment is one hour for Jones as well. We don't have to do it, but we're going to do that just for simplicity. But we're going to assume that Jones's production possibility frontier looks a little bit different. And in fact, it looks like this. So Jones's PPF intercepts the apple axis at 10, and it intercepts the uh, orange axis at 3. So with that information in front of you, you should now be able to write down all of the economic variables and meanings that we put down before. So for example, what is the productivity of, of Jones in oranges? Take a minute, write it, not even a minute, take 10 seconds and write it down. Look at the diagram and tell me what is the productivity of Jones for oranges. No. If I ask you for a number like that, 
always remember to put the units down as well. So the answer is three. It's the intercept right here. But three is not the complete answer. <coughs> Productivity has to be three what? Oranges per hour. So it's got to have units associated with it, or it doesn't have any economic meaning to it. Three oranges per hour. What's the productivity of Jones and Apples? Write it down. So the productivity of Jones and Apples is 10 apples per hour. OK, so what's the unit labor requirement for Jones and Oranges? By the definition, it's one divided by the productivity. So therefore, it's going to be one third. And what are the units? Hours per orange. One third hour per orange is Jones's unit labor requirement for oranges. What is Jones's unit labor requirement for apples? One tenth. One tenth hour per apple. Write down the equation for Jones's production possibility frontier. It's going to be one third. QOJ plus one tenth QA J is equal to one. We've defined some economic terms. We've got production set up for both Smith and Jones. We've got some more things to define, unfortunately. Definition of opportunity cost. Now, in general, opportunity cost means the value of the next best opportunity in doing something. What am I giving up in order to do what I'm doing now? Your opportunity cost of sitting in the classroom right now here is whatever else you might be doing and the value that that would give to you. All of you here tonight have chosen that this is a better opportunity for you than anything else you could be doing right now. I appreciate that. Thank you. In the context of this model, opportunity cost is going to be defined as if you want to produce more of one good, you have to give up production of some production of the other good. Because producing more of one means you have to move your resource, your labor time, out of the production of that other good in order to have more time to produce the good in question. Now, opportunity cost of oranges for Smith is defined in general as the number of apples that he has to give up in order to produce another orange. As such, it's going to be in units of apples per orange. How many apples does he have to give up to produce one more orange? So there's the units. Now, it is going to turn out to be equal to a number of different things, because we've got a number of different variables that we've defined along the way. The first thing, and most important perhaps, is that it's going to correspond to the negative of the slope of Smith's production possibility frontier. So let me flash this back up there to you. Because what the PPF is telling us, if we started at a point like the middle point right here, and okay, you can pick any point on the PPF, and ask the question, how much, how many apples would he have to give up to produce another orange? So you might say, let's suppose he wants to move from five oranges to six oranges. How many apples would he have to give up? Well, to move from there to there, he would have to move from the point like this on his PPF to a point like this. And as a result of that, he's going to have to give up, I don't know, that distance, that many apples in order to produce one more orange. So this is, I'm imagining, one unit. He's got to give up that many apples to produce one more orange. Now, one of the definitions of the slope of a line is that it's equal to the rise over the run between any two points on a line. Find two points on the line, find the rise and the run, and moving from one point to another, make a ratio of that to find the slope of that particular line. Now, in this particular example, the run is one unit. So therefore, the rise has got to be the opportunity cost of oranges. It's how many um, apples have to be given up in order to produce one more orange. We've got to find the rise over the run. It's the slope of that line. Okay, so that's the first definition of opportunity cost. Now, it's the negative of the slope because we generally will refer to opportunity cost as a positive value. Because in the term itself, opportunity cost, we've already got the negativity built in there. 
We know we have to give up one of another good in order to get more of the first. So the cost is built in there. We'll write it as a positive number, but the slope is technically a negative value, right? So it's the negative of the slope, which is the opportunity cost. So that's the first definition. Second definition. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to the third definition. Because one way to calculate the slope of a line is to find two points on it and determine the rise over run. Well, in a line like this, from an endpoint of 3 to an endpoint of, of 10, we actually can calculate the rise over run as 3 units is the rise from that point starting on the end to 10 units over here. Any two points along a straight line is going to give you the same slope. So the rise over run is going to be 3 over 10. The slope of this line is minus 3 tenths, so the opportunity cost of oranges for Smith is actually 3 tenths. But we can also recognize that that value 3 up there was actually equal to the productivity of apples for Smith. Right? So the vertical distance, 3, is the productivity of apples. And the horizontal distance, 10, is the productivity of oranges. So one way to get the opportunity cost of orange production for Smith is to take the productivity of apples divided by the productivity of oranges for Smith. And that's going to give us the opportunity cost. So that's the second definition of opportunity cost. I'm sure you're happy. There's not just one. There's not just two definitions. There's three definitions. The middle definition is because the unit labor requirements are the reciprocals of the productivities, we could plug in the unit labor requirements into that productivity formula, rearrange them, and simplify it. We're going to end up with the following. The unit labor requirement of oranges by Smith divided by the unit labor requirement of apples is going to be equal to Smith's opportunity cost of oranges. All three of these is measured in apples per orange. They're all corresponding to the negative of the slope of the production possibility frontier. Three different ways to get to the same answer. Any one is acceptable. But it means you might be faced with the following complication, if you will. I could show you a graph like this to find a period of time and ask you all the questions about what's the productivities for Smith, what's the unit labor requirements, what's the slope of the line, what's the opportunity cost, in other words. I could ask you all of those questions, and you can answer them just from knowing and seeing this picture and knowing that it's one hour of work being devoted. But maybe I won't give you the picture. Maybe I'll just give you the unit of time, how much time he's devoting, and I'll tell you what his productivities are. <clears throat> from that, you could draw the graph, and you can derive all of these terms and figure out the slope of the line, the PPF, and determine the opportunity cost. Or maybe I'll give you the unit labor requirements. And from the unit labor requirements, you can define the productivities, you can plot the PPF, and calculate the opportunity cost. So all of those are possible. And isn't it amazing how much economic content there can be in just a straight line on a graph? between two endpoints. There's a heck of a lot going on there. Maybe economists just think too hard. All right, none of this is very interesting yet until we get to where we're going. We're trying to get to some, I'm oh, sorry. I was just wondering like, if we're writing the answer, like all of these come out to be three over 10, right? So it's never negative three over 10, even though it's negative slope. Right. So that's why I wrote this as opportunity cost is the negative of the slope. So if you calculate the slope correctly, you're going to come up with a slope of negative 3 tenths. Oh, okay. But you take the <coughs> negative of the negative in order to identify it as a slope. The opportunity cost is just 3 tenths. You've gotten rid of the negative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. This is going to be a really stupid question, um, but just flashbacks from like micro. So since we're denominating in one more orange for every, you know, how many apples you sacrifice to get one more, one more orange. Is there a difference between this and the marginal cost, or is that I'm getting way ahead of myself? 
and the marginal cost is how much it's going to cost you to produce one more unit of output. So it is similar in this, but we're measuring the cost in this context in terms of the other good. Okay. Whereas marginal cost in a typical, you know, microeconomics course is going to be measured in dollar terms. Right. So we're measuring how many dollars, what's the dollar cost of producing an additional unit of output. Right. So the units we're using is different and the context is a little bit different, but there's a similarity there. Okay. Okay. All right, now we've got to apply this. And the next thing we're going to do is come up with, oh, whoa, whoa, got one more thing. Sorry. We can define the opportunity cost of oranges, which is the slope of the PPF, when oranges is on the horizontal axis. But we can also define the opportunity cost of apples. That's going to be the reciprocal of the opportunity cost of, of oranges. And it's going to be in units of, uh, what's the units here? It's going to be in oranges per apple now. So the opportunity cost of apples has oranges on the top and apples on the bottom, oranges per apple. And it's the inverse, the reciprocal of the slope of the PPF when oranges is on the horizontal axis. Yeah? This is just because it's on the y-axis, right? So it would be any products on the Any products. So then, yeah, if I change the products for apples and oranges and call them something else, you're going to have to keep track and make sure you identify which one is on the horizontal or vertical axis. Now, let's apply this definition, these definitions, to some economic concept. We have a definition of a term in trade, and one of these definitions is the concept of absolute advantage. In this market, or this context, we're going to say that a person, like Smith, has an absolute advantage in the production of a good, say X, relative to another person, if A's productivity is larger than B. If Smith's productivity in a good is greater than Jones's productivity in the same good, then we will say Smith has an absolute advantage in the production of that good. So, if the productivity of a good X by A is greater than the productivity of a good X by B, we'll say that A has the absolute advantage in good X. Simple definition. We're just comparing productivities within a particular good. But we can do, since unit labor requirements are just the reciprocals of the productivities, it works in the opposite direction. So, if person A, Smith, has a lower unit labor requirement in a particular good than Jones does, B, then we're going to say that Smith has an absolute advantage in that particular good. He could produce the good at a lower input cost than Smith can, um, than Jones can, sorry. So either of these can be applied, they're going to give you the same answer. In a technical, no, non-technical sense, all we're trying to get at with absolute advantage is who's better at producing a good? Better in terms of being able to achieve a greater output with the same amount of input. Who can produce more of the good than the other? We might say that a person has a technological advantage over another person in some way. They're quicker, they're smarter, they can get to the apples and oranges faster than the other person, they can achieve a greater output with the same amount of input. So they're better at producing the good than the other person. Now, one of the concepts, yeah? Better in quantity or quality? Or both? Always in quantity here, because we haven't introduced any sort of assumptions about varying qualities or changing the quality. And in fact, what we're presuming is that all the apples are the same and all the oranges are the same. We do that to keep the model as simple as possible. So we're focusing on the quantity aspect only. Good question. Let's go back. Let's see if I can do this. There's Smith's PPF. Now there's Jones's PPF. Can we see both of those? Almost. From that, you know the productivity. So, who has the absolute advantage in the production of oranges according to the graphs? Answer is Smith. Smith. Smith's productivity of oranges is 10. Jones's productivity of oranges is 3. 
Smith's better at producing oranges than Jones. So Smith has an absolute advantage in the production of oranges, compared or relative to Jones. Who has the absolute advantage in the production of apples? Jones, because 10 is greater than 3. We reverse the numbers only, and Jones is better at producing apples than Smith is. OK. So we've defined absolute advantage. Next. There's uh, Smith's production possibility frontier. We did do this kind of quickly. But what's his uh, opportunity cost of orange production? Slope of the PPF, 3 divided by 10 <coughs> units. Apples per orange. So it's three tenths, and it's best to write it. You know, a lot of people will want to write three apples per ten oranges. And while that's right, it gets a little bit harder to work with the numbers if you're mixing up the units between the fraction. So it's easier to just write it as three tenths apple per orange. All right, and that'll that'll save you some headaches, I think, in trying to keep track of units. Okay, what is the opportunity cost of Jones for Oranges. Rise over run, 10 thirds apples per orange. But what if I ask you the opposite question? What is Jones's opportunity cost for apple production? It's going to be 3 tenths. It's going to be the reciprocal of that. So it's going to be 3 tenths oranges per apple. Now, all of this becomes important next because our next definition. Comparative advantage. A person has a comparative advantage in the production of a good, say Smith and oranges, if Smith can produce oranges at a lower opportunity cost, OC, than, than Jones can. Or in other words, if opportunity cost of Smith and oranges is less than the opportunity cost of Jones in oranges, then we're going to say that Smith has a comparative advantage in the production of oranges. We could also write it this way. We can look at the ratio of the unit labor requirements, because that's the other way in which we define opportunity costs. And that's that definition. Or we could write it as just the negatives of the slopes of the two PPFs, and just compare slopes like that. Who has the comparative advantage in the production of oranges? The answer is going to be Smith. And the reason is, is because Smith's slope, three tenths apples per orange, is less than Jones's slope, which is ten thirds apples per orange. Opportunity cost for Smith is lower than it is for Jones. Therefore, Smith has the comparative advantage in oranges. But who has the comparative advantage in apples? To do that, we're going to have to look at the opportunity cost for apples. That's the reciprocals of both of these. Smith's is going to become 10 thirds oranges per apple. Jones's is going to become 3 tenths oranges per apple. Who has the lower opportunity cost for apples? That's going to be Jones, because 3 tenths oranges per apple is less than 10 thirds oranges per apple for Smith. So here we have the somewhat unremarkable situation where Smith has the absolute and comparative advantage in oranges. And Jones has the absolute and comparative advantage in apples. Now we're going to go forward and see what happens in this context. But before we do, I want to highlight what is a more interesting result that we're going to look at in a little bit later. It turns out that most people tend to think about trade and the advantages of trade in the context of whether you have an absolute advantage in something. So Adam Smith, go way back to Adam Smith, and he talked about countries coming together and trading with each other. And he had the following idea. He thought that trade could be advantageous, and he explained it something like this. He said, you know, if England is better at producing corn and can produce it cheaper, and if Portugal is better at producing wine, can produce wine cheaper per unit of input, then wouldn't it make sense, he thought, if Portugal exported wine to Britain or to England in exchange for corn. And then if they did that, they would be able to mutually benefit from trade because production was going to take place in the lowest cost country. Everyone can understand that. That makes perfect sense. Not too hard to understand. What he's describing, though, is basically saying, in an 
another context, our context. What if England has an absolute advantage in corn production and Portugal has an absolute advantage in wine production? Then trade could be advantageous. Okay. David Ricardo, about 50 years later, came along and he asked the question, what if one of the countries has the absolute advantage in both of the goods? In other words, what if one country can produce both apples and oranges better than the other? What if Smith were better at producing apples and oranges than Jones was? Now, one's first intuition might be, well, they probably wouldn't trade with each other, because why would you want to trade with a person who can't produce anything cheaply? But it turns out that there are actually advantages to trade that can come about by reorganizing production and trading, even when one person is absolutely better than the other. And what Ricardo discovered mattered in defining how to rearrange production and what to do is that it didn't have anything to do with absolute advantage. It had everything to do with comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is what matters. And as long as you have a comparative advantage in something, trade can be advantageous for you. It turns out you do not have to have an absolute advantage in something or anything in order to have a comparative advantage in something. And we'll look at that case in, in a few minutes. But first, let's go forward and see what result we can come up with by looking at this particular circumstance with, with Smith and Jones producing apples and oranges with both comparative and absolute advantage simultaneously. This is where the power of graphs is going to come into play. And the power of this Edgeworth box diagram that we constructed to talk about exchange between Smith and Jones is going to play a big role. Okay, so here's our production possibility frontier that I just presented to you. Three apples per hour and ten oranges per hour by Smith. But we're first going to imagine that Smith is independent. He lives by himself. He doesn't have any recourse to go to a market and trade with Jones. So he has to consume apples and oranges out of his own production. He can produce apples and oranges for himself, but he's got to decide how many he's going to produce for himself. He has no trading potential or opportunities out there. We would ask, what would he do? How would he decide how many apples and oranges to produce? Well, our answer to that in an economics class like this is that he's going to match his preferences to his production possibilities, and he's going to try to maximize his utility or well-being. So let's imagine that Smith has a set of indifference curves, and I've drawn one of them here. But there are many, many indifference curves that maybe have a similar shape, rising upward and to the right as we increase apples and oranges. How would he decide where to produce? Well, what he would want to do is to find an indifference curve like the one depicted that is just tangent, just touching his production possibility frontier. Because by doing that, he will get to an indifference curve that's as far up and to the right as possible. And therefore, that will get him to the highest level of utility that's possible for him. Notice that if we were to pick a point of production anywhere else along his PPF, like a point like this, and we were to imagine an indifference curve of his drawn through this point here, right, at this point, the indifference curve is going to look like this. It's got to be lower than the indifference curve that's up there and drawn. If we picked a point over here, well, the indifference curve drawn through that is going to have to be lower. So any point he picks along this area or this area of his PPF to produce and consume must clearly give him a lower level of well-being or utility. So what's he going to choose? The one where the tangency occurs right here between the red indifference curve and the production possibility frontier. Now, I have made up the PPF. I just made up the numbers, right? And I have made up his indifference curve. And I just happened to choose it so that it intersected right there in the middle at the point five oranges and one and a half apples. But I could have drawn the indifference curve differently. I could have drawn it to look like this, maybe. And maybe it would have intersected it here demonstrating a greater preference for apples, and maybe he doesn't like oranges very much. Or I could have drawn an indifference curve map that intersected down here. Some, so I can draw the indifference curves in lots of different ways to give him different outcomes, but they always have to have that same 
bowed in shape and they always have to increase to the upper right. What two assumptions give us those features? More is better and diminishing marginal utility. So those two things are going to give us the shape and the positioning of these indifference curves, but they could be drawn in lots of different ways to represent preferences that are a little bit different from each other. I've chosen one that just happens to be in the middle. That's just happenstance. It's just random in some sense. All right. What about um, Jones? Now we're going to jump to our old trick of imagining that Jones does everything upside down. So Jones is here, and he's got his origin up there on the upper right. So his utility is increasing in the lower left direction. And his production possibility frontier is the same we presented before switched around. Now it's upside down. So he can produce 10 apples in an hour, or he can produce three oranges in an hour. He's got a set of indifference curves, just like Smith does. But I've actually adjusted his indifference curves to also give him a nice intersection in the no trade situation of five apples in this case and one and a half oranges. So he's on his midpoint of his PPF again. Doesn't have to be that way. It just happened. It just draws up nicely that way. All right. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to create an Edgeworth box. And the Edgeworth box is going to be created under the following assumption, first of all. Smith and Jones get up in the morning. They work an hour. They work an hour under the expectation that they're going to consume the apples and oranges that make them happiest at the end of the day or during the day. All right, so they go out, they work. Smith produces five oranges and one and a half apples. I don't know how you get a half, but we'll just make believe he can do it. Jones gets five apples and one and a half oranges, and they stick them in their backpack and they go out for a walk. Whereupon they meet each other in a field somewhere in between where they live for the first time ever. And they're coming to the market with an endowment of apples and oranges. But it's not 10 apples and 10 oranges like we had before. No, Smith has five oranges and one and a half apples. Jones has five or apples and one and a half oranges. And we have to ask, will they find it advantageous to trade with each other? Now, without any diagrams and without any stuff to look at, our answers would have to be, I have no idea. I don't know, maybe they'll want to trade, maybe they won't. I don't know what they're going to do. But with the diagrams, we can actually come up with an answer. And how do we do that? Well, we create an Edgeworth box. And we do that, let me see if this is going to work. It is not going to work. I want to be able to move this. Because what we want to do is we want to take this diagram with that point, that endowment point, or that, yeah, that endowment that Jones is coming to the market. We want to superimpose it on top of this point right here which is the production point for Smith, and see what it looks like. Don't worry. We take the two and we superimpose the endowment points. That creates an Edgeworth box for us that looks like this. And the Edgeworth box, remember, is the total amount of apples and oranges that are being brought to the marketplace for consideration for trade. All right, and Smith is bringing five oranges and one and a half, and, and Jones is bringing one and a half oranges. So the total number of oranges, six and a half. That's the distance from here, zero, to this point right here, which is six and a half. Jones is bringing five apples to the market, and Smith is bringing one and a half apples, giving us a vertical distance on this Edgeworth box of six and a half apples. Now, their endowment point is not in the corner like we had done before. Now it's in the middle. But quite nicely, we can see that at that point in the middle, Jones's indifference curve, the blue line, is intersecting with Smith's indifference curve, the red line, and is clearly creating a lens. What's the significance of the lens? Why does that matter? The best outcomes are in the for Smith and Jones are in the center. The best outcomes. And what's going to happen if they get to the How do they get to the center? Trade. trade. And if they trade, what's going to happen to their well-being? 
lenses. Both of them is going to go up, right? So if you've got any kind of a lens that's formed by the intersection of their endowments points in the market, they're not at a Pareto optimal point. They haven't exhausted all the gains from trade. There are possibilities for them to move up into the lens through trade and actually both end up on a higher <coughs> difference curve, increasing their overall well-being. So I can look at that, and we know that Smith maximizing utility, Jones maximizing utility, gives us the shape of their indifference curves. The reason why this trade becomes possible is entirely based on the fact that the slopes of their PPFs are different from each other. And the slopes of the PPFs are different because we assumed they had different productivities over the goods. So this whole model is being predicated on an assumption that the individuals have different abilities in production. One has an absolute advantage in oranges in this case, the other has an absolute advantage in apples. And because of that, when they come to the market and think about trade, we can see right here that there will definitely be an advantage to trading. So they will trade some apples for some oranges. Let's imagine that they do it simply and say, let's suppose that they start from here and they decide just to keep it really simple, they're going to trade like one orange for one apple. Or maybe they'll trade one and a half oranges for one and a half apples and end up to a point like that. So I'm going to keep the terms of trade in my story very, very simple. It's one for one. And there's a one for one trade that will work, that will move them up into this lens somewhere. One for one, one and a half for one and a half, anything like that is going to get you up here. They're both going to be better off. So therefore, trade can be advantageous. But, but that's the same story we told before. There's nothing really too new here. <clears throat> but there is. Because now we're going to go and imagine that Smith and Jones have just experienced something that they hadn't experienced before, trade. They traded apples for oranges, and they go home with a different bundle of goods that they recognize makes them happier than the bundle of goods that they had consumed before. Now, if they trade one and a half for one and a half, Smith is going to give, uh, let's do one for one because it's easier to do the calculations. Smith gives up one orange, he's going to end up with four oranges, right? And he's going to end up with two and a half apples. He's going to end up with, go back to this. He's going to end up with four oranges. He's going to end up with what did I say? Two apples, right? Two and, a half. Two and a half apples. That's going to put him at a point like this. He's going to be able to consume at a point like that because of trade with, with Jones. Now notice, that point that he's able to consume now was not possible for him before. On his own, he could never achieve that particular production point or consumption point. But with trade, he's able to do it. So this should come to him as a kind of remarkable thing that has happened he's able to achieve a consumption level that's better than he did before. But what's really cool is that Jones is now consuming what? With a one-for-one -one trade. He's giving up one apple in exchange for one orange, and that's moving him to a point like this. So simply by trade, he too, Jones, is getting to a point that he was not able to achieve before. He's able to increase his overall utility to some level of consumption that he was not able to achieve independently. So both of them are going home with an idea that they can both be better off as a result of this trade. That was the story we told before about, about pure exchange. But now, let's imagine the story unfolds a little bit further. Because let's imagine that Smith, sitting at home after making this trade, talking about it with his family or what have you, says to himself, well, wait a minute. I just traded one apple for one orange. He thinks about his terms of trade that he just realized with Jones in that, in that trade during the day. He traded one apple for one orange. One apple per orange. PO over PA is one apple per orange. That's the price that he was able to get in the marketplace. Now, we go back to his production possibility frontier. In his original production level, he was producing five oranges. And he might ask himself, if I want to produce one more apple, how many oranges would I have to give up? No, I don't want to do it that way. 
If I'm going to produce one more orange, how many apples do I have to give up? Let's do that. His answer is three-tenths of an apple has to be given up for him to acquire one more orange. In other words, what we're saying is that this, the opportunity cost, is his cost of producing oranges. It costs him three-tenths of an apple to produce an orange. But he can get now, he realizes, based on his trade with Jones on the first day, he can get one apple in exchange for every orange in the marketplace. So if he sells his orange in the market, he gets one apple in exchange. But to produce an additional orange, he only has to give up three-tenths of an apple at home in his production. So he's likely to make that comparison while he's lying in bed thinking about all the other possibilities. He could have realized, wait, I get one for one on the market. I only have to give up three-tenths of an orange in production. What if I could come tomorrow with more oranges in my backpack? And I can continue to sell more of them at a rate of one for one. I'll be able to make a profit because the price I get in the market is greater than the cost of producing oranges. The terms of trade is greater than the opportunity cost of producing oranges. So orange production is profitable. I can make more money, I'm thinking as Smith, if I can come to the market with more oranges and continue to trade them at a rate of one per one. So let's suppose he thinks that and does that. Jones is thinking about things upside down, of course. And he's going to look at it from the perspective of the price of apples in the market. And he's going to say, hey, what's the price of apples per orange? Oranges per apple. It's going to be one orange per apple. It's the reciprocal. And he's going to look at his production possibilities and note that his opportunity cost of apple production is three-tenths but it's three-tenths oranges per apple. So Jones is going to realize that the price of an apple, PA over PO, on the marketplace, is greater than the cost of his production of apples. And if he thinks about it, he might do the same as Smith and say, hey, it would be better for me, more profitable, if I could produce more apples and bring them to the market, and if I could trade them one for one with, Joe, with Smith, that would be even better for me. So, each of them are motivated by what? Self-interest. They're both motivated by self-interest to do what's in their own interest, what's going to be best for them. And they're going to adjust their production in subsequent days if they're motivated by self-interest. Now, what jo uh, Smith is going to do is he's going to want to shift in the direction of producing more oranges. He's produced another orange, another two, but if he wants to maximize his profit, and he knows he can get one for one on the market, or he assumes that, then he's going to try to maximize his production of oranges and bring them to the market for trade. That means he's going to slide down his production possibility frontier and specialize. So Jones has the incentive, uh, Smith has the incentive to produce oranges. He's going to move his production point in subsequent days all the way down to here and produce 10 oranges. Now, he wouldn't want to do that unless he had the potential for trade, because if he just produced 10 oranges and consumed them himself, he's on a lower indifference curve, he's going to be made worse off. So the only reason for specialization is if he's got somebody out there he's going to be able to trade with. Jones has the same incentive, but in the opposite direction. He's going to have an incentive to slide down his PPF to produce nothing but apples. Because for Jones, apples are going to be profitable based on the data. And for Smith, oranges are going to be profitable. So they slide down and they specialize in apples and oranges. And in the next day, instead of this duplicating itself, instead, Jones slips down to this point. Smith slips down to that point, And we superimpose these two points on the graph to create the Edgeworth box for the next day which looks like this. Now they have specialized in the production of the good in which they happen to have a comparative advantage. And they've been motivated to produce that good, to specialize in that good, by self-interest and profit motivation. They're interested in increasing their own welfare, and if they follow their own signal, 
They're going to specialize in the good in which they happen to have a comparative, and in this case, absolute advantage, and produce more of them. Now, when they come to the market, notice, first of all, and most importantly, that the Edgeworth box has increased in size. It's gone from 6 and a half by 6 and a half to 10 by 10. So immediately, the big effect of specialization is that it expands the amount of both apples and oranges that are available to consume by the two individuals. And that is a very important part about why specialization and comparative advantage can be beneficial for individuals. Production increases. It's important to know, too, that there is no change in technology here. There's no technological change. There's no increase in productivity. They both have the same capabilities as they had before, but they just rearranged who produces what. And by doing that appropriately, they've actually increased the total number of apples and total number of oranges to the marketplace. Now, they trade. But they're going to trade not one for one and get to some meager point like this. Right now, they're going to trade to, I don't know, something like E, or maybe beyond over here. They're going to trade five, uh, four for four or five for five. And they're going to move much further out and notice that if they could trade, say, four for four, here's Smith's PPF, but he's going to now be able to achieve a point like E, potentially. That's way above what he was ever possible, what was ever able or, or conceivable for him to consume before. So, through specialization and trade, both parties can actually increase their well-being. And we have more goods to go around. We have well-being rising, standards of living for the two rising, all a result of specialization in, in the comparative advantage good and trading. And that's a pretty remarkable result. Let's look at another graph. <clears throat> Here's a diagram that shows two PPFs, they're the blue lines. Has two individuals, Smith and Jones. I could ask you some questions about this, and I will. So look at the diagram and write down on your piece of paper in front of you, just test your knowledge of what we've done today, and tell me what is Smith's productivity of oranges, according to the diagram. Smith's PPF, here's his origin. There is Smith's PPF. Smith's production uh, productivity of oranges is intercept over here. It's going to be 10 oranges per hour. What is Jones's productivity for oranges? Now, Jones's origin is up here. Jones's PPF is this. Five oranges per hour. That's this point right here. So Jones can produce five oranges per hour, Smith can produce 10 oranges per hour. What could we say about that? With that, Smith has an absolute advantage in the production of oranges. Okay, who has, uh, what is Smith's productivity in apples? Six. Origin? Six. Smith can produce six apples per hour. What is Jones's productivity for apples? One, two, three, four, five, counting this way. Five apples per hour. Who has the absolute advantage in apples? Smith. So here's an example. Smith has the absolute advantage in both apples and oranges. Okay, but what is Smith's opportunity cost for oranges? Oh, six. Write it down. What's Smith's opportunity cost for oranges? Everyone, write it down. Get the units right. What is Jones's opportunity cost for oranges? Write it down. Whose opportunity cost for oranges is lower? Smith, because six over ten which is his opportunity cost for oranges, or three-tenths, or three-fifths, or 0.6. Anyone is fine? So 0.6 is less than 5 over 5, which is 1. Jones's opportunity cost for oranges is one apple per orange. So 
Smith has the comparative advantage in the production of oranges. Who has the comparative advantage in the production of apples? Jones. It's going to be Jones. In this case, Jones's opportunity cost of apples is one orange per apple, reciprocal of five over five. Still one. But Smith's opportunity cost of apples is going to be 10 divided by 6, or 5 divided by 3, or what is it? Uh, 1 and 2 thirds. That's just greater than 1. So 1 is less than 1 and 2 thirds. Therefore, Jones has a comparative advantage in apple production. Even though Jones is worse at producing both apples and oranges, the comparative advantage lies with Jones in apples. Now, what we're depicting in this diagram is a situation where each individual who might consume independently at the black dot right here, and I've again made up those points, could, in recognizing that there could be advantageous trade between them, at a terms of trade that lies somewhere in between the slopes of their PPFs, and that's what a trading terms of trade would have to be to make both of them better off. So by trading at a terms of trade that lies in between the slopes of their PPFs, they could have an incentive to specialize in the production of their comparative advantage goods, Smith producing only oranges at 10, Jones producing only apples at 5, and then trading to a point like that represented by the intersection, the uh, tangency of the blue and the red and difference curves. So what we're depicting with this diagram is the potential for trade and improvement in welfare for both traders, even though Jones is worse at producing both apples and oranges than Smith. He's going to be led by an invisible hand, I like to say sometimes. He's led by an invisible hand, which is the profit motive. The profit motive for him is going to make him recognize that the terms of trade he can get in the marketplace and trade is greater than Jones's opportunity cost of producing apples. And because for that, it's going to be profitable for Jones to produce more apples in this context. So even though he's worse at producing apples than Smith, another way to think about this is that Jones is worse at producing both apples and oranges, but he's less worse at producing apples. And the thing that he's less worse at is his comparative advantage. Let me put it the other way. Smith is better at producing oranges and apples than Jones, but if we said, how much better is he? We would say that Smith is twice as productive in producing oranges than Jones is, because he can produce 10 oranges to, Smith's, uh, to Jones's five oranges per hour. So Smith is two times as productive in oranges than Jones. But if we ask that same question about him with respect to apples, we would say that Smith is six-fifths, or one and one-fifth times more productive than Jones in apple production. So he's better at producing both of them, but he's a lot better at producing oranges than he is apples. As a result, Jones is worse at both of these, but he's less worse at producing apples than he is at producing oranges compared to Smith. So the comparative advantage turns out to be produce the good, which if you're better at everything, you're most better at producing. In a sense, we might put Smith and Jones into a real market setting with market prices, dollar prices on everything, and say, go out there and do your best. Smith, being more productive at everything, might look at the world and say, hey, I can produce oranges profitably. I can produce apples profitably. I can produce all sorts of things profitably. I'm good at everything. What should Smith produce, though, in order to maximize overall production? The answer is, produce the thing which he makes the most money at. <coughs> produce the thing which he's most best at producing. He's got the greatest advantage. That's his comparative advantage, because he can't do everything. Or shouldn't. He has a limited amount of time. Everybody does. So you can't produce everything. So leave the things you're less good at producing to the others to produce. And Jones is going to be the same way. He's going to go out there and say, well, I can't produce anything very well, but the thing I'm relatively best at is going to be apples. And so better to put Jones to work and have him produce apples or oranges. And if you're going to have him produce something, have him produce the thing which his 
disadvantage is the smallest, which you can produce least bad, because that's going to be the best to boost overall production of all of the goods in the economy. And how does Jones find what that is? Answer from the model is pursue profit. Try to make more money. And Jones will find apple production profitable in this particular context. So that's kind of cool. Following the profit motive leads firms to produce the goods in which they have a comparative advantage. And through trade, we can increase production and increase well-being of everybody involved. But here I want to hesitate just a minute and remind you what we talked about at the beginning of the class, which is you can't just go after money willy-nilly and do everything that you can to make more money. Because if you violate those ethical principles we talked about, if you decide, hey, I could make a lot of money by cheating Jones out of a bunch of stuff, then you're not in the realm of this model. You're not a creating win-win outcomes for both. You're not necessarily increasing total output. You're not achieving the efficiencies that are depicted in this particular model. So it's necessary for the individuals to follow those ethical principles, respect property, not be deceptive with each other, be true about the products you're selling to each other, maintain good information about the trades that are taking place, be honest. All of those matter in terms of us achieving the good outcomes that are depicted here. So profit seeking is good with the constraints that we've emphasized prior, earlier. Questions, thoughts? Yes. After each specialized and then trade, uh, the best possible outcome for both is the tangent only. It can be going left or to, to the right. You mean this point here? Yeah. Well, this point is going to be the point where we, we've achieved a Pareto optimum, at least. And it's a kind of a point which, as you can see, I could draw a line between there and this endowment point now. And that would give us the profit maximizing conditions being satisfied. The terms of trade is equal to the marginal rate of substitution, which will be associated with the slopes of the indifference curves. Those are equal to each other and equal approximately to the slope of the line to the endowment point. So that would be the kind of a point that would depict the final outcome. So the world is a lot more complicated than this, but this gives us some insight about how the world can work. All right, now let's extend this whole idea to the notion of international trade for a minute. And think about what this would mean about international trade between two individual countries. Now let's think of Smith and Jones as not two people, but two separate countries out there in the world. Now the first thing to do is when we recognize that Smith's PPF is not an individual's PPF, but it's a nation's PPF, then shifting along the PPF involves moving workers, maybe, or resources out of one industry and into another industry. So if you're going to shift between apple production and orange production, you're going to take the workers who are working in your country in apple production, and you're going to move them into the production of oranges. And if you've got resources like capital equipment and machinery and trucks and things like that, you're going to move those out of production of one good into the production of another. So moving up and down the PPF or a country means shifting people's responsibilities and work from one industry to another industry. OK. Now, when we shift that, we're imagining, just like Smith and Jones are unaffected by whether they collect apples or oranges, we're imagining that workers also don't really care where they're working. And that you can pick them up and move them from one industry to another costlessly. No costs are incurred, there's no inconvenience suffered, there's no problems. Decide tomorrow that we're going to specialize in orange production in the Smith country. You just tell everybody, show up to work at the orange groves and you're going to collect there instead today, and everybody does, and there's no problem. Now, that might be fine when we're talking apples and oranges, but it might not work so well if we're talking about, I don't know, apples and computer software. Right? So we say, oh, you're not going to produce apples today. Sorry, just show up and write some code. <laughs> we might begin to recognize that there might be some friction, some difficulties with moving workers from one industry to another if the skills are not perfectly fungible. And if the capital equipment designed to produce apples, that might not really work very well if you try to take some you know, big bins and say, well, how do we use this effectively in software code writing? 
I don't know what we're going to do with it. So equipment that people don't move very easily from one industry to another sometimes, but this model at uh, this particular stage of it assumes that it can be done. Now, let's say we move from a point of autarky. Autarky means no trade between a country and another country. And that would be the kind of a situation a country would be in, deciding, hey, we can only produce apples and oranges, let's produce at the point which maximizes the utility of all of the people that are here in the country. We're going to produce some apples, some oranges, because people like both of them, and we produce somewhere on the midpoint of our, or somewhere in the middle of the PPF. But when you open up to trade with another country then, what you're doing is giving the opportunity to move the country outside of its production possibility frontier. But in order to achieve that, here's what the important thing is. You've got to move your resources out of, for the Smith country, out of apple production and move them entirely over into orange production. So you're switching the workers from one industry and moving them into another. Now, if you do that, and if Jones, that country, moves all of their workers over into apple production here, and then you trade between the two countries, the two countries will, according to the model, be able to achieve a higher level of overall consumption in both countries than they were able to achieve before. <coughs> so there will be an overall increase in well-being. And if we were to look at the particulars and ask about the individual workers and say, are the workers better off in this very simple model if we specialized in our comparative advantage good in the country and traded with the other country, the answer would be, yes, everybody is better off. The cool thing about the Ricardian model of trade, in school in part because it's really simple, is that everyone gains from trade. Everyone comes out ahead after specialization in trade, and there are no losers. So trade is win-win, win-win-win for everybody everywhere. Trade is a good thing. Yeah. Is there ever tension between countries if benefit is in? Well, so if you're both winning, but one person is only winning a little bit, the other person is winning a lot, is that... Might be possible, and the model doesn't really say too much about that, but it does suggest that that could be conceivable. So you might trade to a point where, you know, you're not right here in the middle. Maybe you trade to a point that's right over here, so that the Smith country doesn't gain very much, just a little bit, and the Jones country gains a bunch. As long as they're both gaining, though, they've got a better opportunity than they would have been had they not traded at all. So we would still consider that a good outcome for them. But you're right, maybe the distribution is not going to be equal. Now in the model itself, when we put this model together in an international trade context, we usually make the simplifying assumption that all the workers are identical. They have the same skills, they get the same income and the same wage. It's really a simple model. So we're not able to address some of the problems associated with inequalities that might arise, some people becoming better off and some people becoming worse off because we've simplified the model to the extent that we're only really focusing on the efficiency improvements of greater production and the fact that the countries can, through trade, kind of bump up their total production and consumption sets by virtue of better production through specialization and comparative advantage goods. So we get that output increase, and that output increase can come about because of profit-seeking and everybody is better off in the simplicity of the model than the simplicity of the model. Now, there's a couple of things that come about, and these are some oddities, if you will. So let me point out that countries tend to look at international trade, and they don't see the result like we're depicting in this model all the time. They don't see that everybody gains. A lot of times, developing countries look at trade potential and they say something like the following. They say, we can't compete in international markets. And the reason we can't compete is because the firms in the developed world are much, much more productive than we could ever achieve. So if we were to open up to trade and try to compete with firms in the developed world, we could beat up. I mean, all their firms are better than our firms, so we couldn't gain from trade. What that story is missing and not quite understanding or recognizing is they're basing that story on this notion that you have to have an absolute advantage in the production of something in order for trade to be advantageous. 
And what the Ricardian model opens our, mo our minds up to, this model of trade opens our minds up to is you don't necessarily have to be better at producing something for trade to be a winning situation. So that conclusion, I need to be better at something in order to trade advantageously, is refuted by the simple model. It suggests that it doesn't necessarily have to work out that way. And that's a surprising result. Now, there's another surprising result that comes from the other side. When developed, when developed countries, like the United States, looks out at trade with the rest of the world, they often make comments like the following. We can't compete with goods from China and Vietnam because they pay their workers such low wages that the costs of their goods are incredibly low. And if we opened up to free trade with them, well, they would produce all of our clothing and all of our toys and all of our appliances. Everything would be produced abroad. We'd have nothing to produce at home. The argument is that wages are so low abroad that we can't compete with them. Now, but what we could do with this model is calculate the wages of workers in the countries that are trading potentially with each other. Look at the wages of the Smith country and the Jones country here. And what we would discover is that, indeed, the Jones country, having lower productivity of both apples and oranges, actually pays their workers less than the Smith country would. So when we opened up to trade, it would be true that the Jones country produces all of, pays all their workers lower wages. But it also it turns out to be true that even despite that, <clears throat> it is not true that the Jones country would suddenly take over and produce absolutely everything. They would produce the things at which their wage benefit, if you will, the low wage benefit that they get, outweighs the productivity disadvantage that they have. I'm sorry, those would be the goods that they, uh, they don't produce. <clears throat> they would continue to produce the goods where their wages are lower, but not where their productivity disadvantage is not so great. And so, they would find it in their interest to continue to produce something, but not everything. The country that's better at producing everything, like say the United States in a context, would be have higher wages that they have to pay all their workers. But the higher wages they have to pay to workers will be overwhelmed in some industries by the much, much, much higher productivity that you get in those industries. And that's going to make it profitable for a country like the United States or the European Union or other developed countries to continue to produce goods profitably, even though wages are paid, or lower, or lower wages are paid to all of the workers in the developing countries. So both of those arguments are flawed, or at least contradicted, by what the Ricardian model results in. And yet, it's very common for people to make those arguments and say, we have to close off trade with developing countries because it's killing us. Developing countries go, we got to close off trade with the developed worlds because it's killing us. So they're both looking at two different sides, but they're not taking the full picture into account. And that's what we're trying to do with this Ricardian model. Okay. Last time was about two models that we've introduced into our discussion. One is a pure exchange model, two individuals just coming together and trading apples for oranges, both able through mutually voluntary exchange and with good information, I'm going to leave the market happier than when they came to the market, simply by rearranging the goods in which they're consuming. That improvement in utility, we actually have a name for it, I want to emphasize it here, it would be called an increase in, an increase in consumption efficiency. There's no extra production taking place in the pure exchange model. People are just rearranging who gets to consume what through trade. And as a result of that, they both walk away happier than they were before. So there's an improvement in utility that is achieved entirely by just reorganizing who gets to consume the goods. So there's a better allocation of consumption, we would say, <laughs> leading to that improvement in utility. That's a good thing. The second model introduced production into the mix of things. And there we got to see the second expansion of goodness, if you will, that can arise in a, in a simple model. And that was, if the individuals specialize in the good in which they can have a comparative advantage and shift their production there, that's going to actually increase the total quantity of both apples and oranges or wine and cheese or whatever the two goods are. It's going to increase total output. Even though there's been no increase in input of labor and there's been no increase in technology at all, simply by reorganizing production on the basis of comparative advantage is enough to increase the total number of 
apples and oranges produced in the economy. And that we would call an increase in production efficiency. So production efficiency is like getting greater productivity out of the economy. We get more stuff with the same amount of inputs. Consumption efficiency is just the increase in utility that comes about by reorganizing consumption. Okay, so we got those two results. If we stopped right there and said, well, what does this tell us about international trade or even just trade between two individuals? It tells us the trade is a good thing, that both sides are going to walk away happier as a result of specialization and the subsequent trade than they did before they came to the marketplace. And so markets are good, trade is good, um, everybody wins, there is no detrimental effects as a result of trade. And if we expand that or extend it to the international economy, we might clearly argue that, well, when two countries come together, it's simply somebody on one side of the border deciding they want to exchange freely and voluntarily with somebody on the other side of the border. And therefore, when they come and exchange goods with each other, money for goods or goods for money or goods for goods, it must be that they're making themselves better off as a result of that exchange. And it can motivate the specialization in goods in which you have a comparative advantage if you're seeking profits. And therefore, trade internationally can be thought of as a win-win situation. Everybody's gaining. Now, there's a little bit of a problem with that conclusion because when we do look at the real world around us, we often see lots of people who object to opening up to markets and, and, and to international trade. We've got individuals who object to free trade agreements and there's lots of opposition to that. So we might wonder, well, if it benefits everybody, why on earth would people be against it? Well, there are reasons to be against it and it, it requires us to expand or extend the model and make it a little bit more complicated. And that's what we're going to do today in a very, very simple way. And we're going to start with a schematic diagram that mimics the story that we have already been telling. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our pure exchange model for a moment. And in a simpler setting or depiction here, we're just going to imagine that we have two individuals, Smith and Jones, who are coming together with apples and oranges and trading mutually voluntarily with each other and with good information. And I'm making up a terms of trade here. So let's assume that they trade six apples for six oranges. And as a result, we were highlighting down here at the bottom, the final consumption pattern uh, for the individual farmers after trade has occurred. So Smith is consuming four oranges and six apples. And we know that if it's mutually voluntary, he must believe that this is better for him than consuming just 10 oranges or he wouldn't have traded. And the same thing is true for Jones. Jones has six oranges and four apples. That's better than he would have had had he not traded at all. Trade is good. Same conclusion we had before. Now, to enter, to introduce an, another element to it, we're going to change the story just a little. Now we're going to say that Smith and Jones have been coming together on a regular basis, trading six apples for six oranges, mutually, voluntarily, and to their advantage for a long time. But Farmer Kim is a new producer or seller of apples. And he wanders upon this particular market one day with 10 apples in his backpack, uh, eager to make a trade because he's stuck consuming nothing but 10 apples every day. He's heard about this wonderful place where you can exchange these apples for this other kind of fruit called an orange and how that orange might actually provide him with an extra amount of utility than the 10th apple, for example. So he, he's eager to enter the market and to participate in trade he shows up one day with 10 apples, and let's suppose he shows up just prior to the exchange of six for six between Smith and Jones. And we might ask, how is that going to affect, in particular, the terms of trade? Now, to take the next step forward, we have to envision or think about what the motivation is for the individual traders. And I'm going to impose the motivation of utility maximization or utility seeking on the part of the individuals in question here. So we're going to imagine that Smith, as an example, seeks to get as much as he can out of the trades that he's going to make with now Jones and Kim. And if he's utility seeking, he's trying to raise his own individual happiness, and he's going to recognize he's got a unique opportunity here with the presence of Farmer Kim, because he can start to bargain. And he can bargain by saying, well, wait a minute, Jones, you've been giving me six for six, and that's been an okay deal. But I wonder what Kim would be willing to give in exchange for the oranges that I might give to him. Now, Kim, eager to be a participant in this market at all and make any kind of an exchange, is likely to offer Joan, uh, Smith a better terms of trade. 
And a better terms of trade might mean something like trading seven apples for, th for, for six oranges or something, of, something like that. Now, if he makes it seven apples per oranges, then notice that the terms of trade, apples per orange, is going to become seven-sixth. It's greater than one. The price is going up. And it would be the price of oranges relative to apples right here. Price of oranges over apples would go up. But let's imagine that Smith is kind of fair-minded, and he gets a better offer from Kim in the first round. But Jones counters by saying, oh, wait a minute. If you're going to give him seven for six, maybe I'll give you a better deal as well. Because he doesn't want to be left in the cold and go home with just ten apples. So anyway, we can imagine a more extended conversation is likely to ensue as they try to negotiate what an acceptable terms of trade would be. Okay, so here's what I've envisioned. And I've just, again, made up these numbers as an example. Let's imagine that Smith is fair-minded in the sense that he's going to offer the same terms of trade to both Jones and Kim in the end. And they negotiate back and forth until they settle on the following. Let's suppose that they decide to trade two apples per orange with each other, and they can trade as much as they want. And let's suppose further that Farmer Jones now <coughs> trades six apples for three oranges, and Farmer Kim also trades the same thing, six apples for three oranges. OK, now we might ask, what's the final outcome? So Smith has used his bargaining capacity in this context. He's actually negotiated a higher price of oranges relative to apples, and he's going to end up, as we can see, with now 12 apples and how many oranges? Four oranges as a result of the trades that he's now engaging with Kim and Jones. If we go back and note that originally he had four oranges and six apples, now he's got 12 apples, twice the number of apples and the same number of oranges, he's coming out quite a bit ahead. He's better off, in other words, as a result of the presence of Farmer Kim in the marketplace. And he's going to think the presence of Farmer Kim is a good thing. All right, but we take a look at Farmer Jones and think about his outcome as a result of Kim's presence in the market. And here, quite clearly, he's trading six apples for three oranges. His final consumption bundle afterwards is going to be three oranges and four apples, whereas he had six oranges and four apples in the previous day when he was trading um, exclusively with Smith. <coughs> so in other words, Jones is going to lose half of his oranges relative to the day before. He's not going to be really happy about this particular outcome, right? So Jones does not feel like he has gained as a result of the presence of Kim in the marketplace. Now, Kim, what about him? Is he better or worse off relative to last week? Do we know? Better. better. Why better? Because he's got oranges. Last week he was stuck, or yesterday he was stuck consuming nothing but 10 apples. The fact that he made a trade, he came away with three oranges and four apples at the end. It must be, he wouldn't have made that trade unless it made him better off. So he must be better off. So Kim is better off as a result of engaging in trade in a particular marketplace. All right, so simple story, but we can draw some very important lessons from this particular story. Now, the first thing we can note is but this is actually, we can kind of classify it in terms of international trade by drawing a line right here and imagining that Smith and Jones are in the United States, Kim is in Korea, and what we have just seen is an engagement of international trade between two individual countries. Okay? So think about it that way. Kim is in Korea, Smith and Jones are in the United States. Now, when we look at the participants in the United States to this exchange, we can classify Smith and Jones in terms of the trade pattern that ensues between the two countries. And the trade pattern is the United States exports oranges to Korea and imports apples from Korea, right? So that's the pattern of trade. Next, we can classify Smith as an exporter. And we can classify Jones as an import competitor. He's not importing directly, but he's competing with imports from Korea. And finally, we can assess now what are the gains and losses to be had as a result of opening up to trade and exporting and importing a particular product. And our answer to this from this simple model is exporters are going to benefit as a result of opening up to trade with Korea here, while the import competing firms or individuals are going to lose out as a result of opening up to trade. 
And that becomes a much more likely and a regular outcome that we will get in many other more complicated trade models if we have the time to pursue them and to investigate them in more detail. We end up with winners and losers, in other words, in the marketplace because of opening up to international trade. And it's very clear that we tend to see exporters benefit from trade, import competitors lose. Now, if we kind of match and look out in the world around us and say, well, who is it that tends to be advocates of international trade? And one thing you might notice is that industries that tend to export to the world tend to be very strong supporters of free trade agreements and international trade more generally. So companies like Boeing or our movie industry or our music industry or others like that are usually very eager to engage in international trade and make trade agreements with other countries. Why? Because they see lots of markets and lots of opportunities to sell their products abroad. Our simple model here says by opening up to trade and exporting a product to the world, you might make yourself better off as a company. But the import competitors lose from trade. And we will look at, say, the United States and ask, well, who complains about trade with the rest of the world? It tends to be industries like textiles and apparel, clothing, steel industry, automobile industry sometimes. Industries where we import a lot of products from the rest of the world. And the more those products get imported, the more import competing industries suffer negative consequences as a result. So what that means is that more generally, International trade is indeed going to cause what economists like to call a redistribution of income, if you will. That means some people are going to benefit with getting higher income. That's Smith in this story. Some people are going to lose out as a result of a changed circumstance because they're going to get less income. Jones gets to consume fewer oranges and the same number of apples, so he's worse off as a result of the opening up to trade with Korea in this simple schematic example. And that's the general result we'll see in some complica more complicated models of international trade. But now, I want to illustrate a couple of other points that come from this very simple example as well. And point out, really, that Smith is made better off not, not, not because Kim is Korean. It doesn't really matter to Smith whether Kim is coming from the rest of the world or not. Suppose Kim is just some other farmer in Washington State who decided to enter the market and begin selling apples to the U.S. market. The same kind of story would ensue, right? Smith would become better off because he'd have more bargaining power. Jones, an apple grower from New York State or something, is now suddenly facing competition from an apple grower in Washington State and they're losing money as a result of the entrant of this new apple grower in the United States. So it doesn't matter whether it's international trade or not. What really is stimulating the losses to Jones is the entrant of a new firm, or another way of saying that, competition with other firms. Jones is made worse off when he has to compete with another firm selling a similar product or the same product as he selling. And if you add another firm, you add another farmer selling apples, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, you're going to, as you add more and more competition in the apple industry, the worse off Jones is going to become with each and every step. Leading us to a very logical and obvious conclusion, maybe. Individual firms love to have and be the only seller in a marketplace. Your best position as a producer of a particular good is to have a monopoly be the only seller of the good. Go back to your in introductory microeconomics classes, you should have learned that what monopolists do relative to competitive markets is they lower the quantity, they raise the price so as to increase their profitability to themselves at the expense of consumers in the marketplace. Firms love monopolies. Firms do not love competition. And the more competition there is, the worse off Jones as what I'll call an incumbent firm a firm that was there selling in the market originally. Incumbent firms hate new entrants coming into the marketplace. So now I'm tempted to say that firms hate competition, but I have to kind of classify the two types of firms. We've got the incumbent firm, they hate competition. But the upstarts, the new entrants, the people that are coming in and selling a product for the first time, they love competition because they're able to now start selling a product that they were not able to engage in trade before. Kim certainly likes being in the market rather than out of the market. New entering firms 
love to participate. And they are gaining as a result of entering the marketplace. Now, let's flip the story a little bit and talk about Smith. Smith is a seller of oranges. We have to recognize, too, that he's got another role in this market. He is also a buyer or consumer of apples. And we can think about how Smith's fate is affected now not by international trade, but by the presence of com competition in the products in which he happens to consume. What we see in this simple story is that Smith's well-being is enhanced when there's two farmers selling apples relative to being one farmer selling apples. Smith, as a consumer of apples, is happier with competition. And all consumers of products should therefore be happier with competition in the industries of the goods in which they're purchasing. So we'd all as consumers like to have lots and lots and lots of products all competitively produced because the more competitive they are, the lower will be the prices, the less monopoly profit to be earned by the firm, and the better advantage it'll be for the individual consumers. All right, so consumers love competition, producers hate competition. And we should recognize that very simple principle because it illustrates and helps us understand an awful lot about conversations that happen about policies and interventions and things like that. Now, this original story of kind of Smith and Jones coming to or Smith and Jones entering a market and having Kim enter was first I, I'm borrowing from a, a talk that I saw uh, years and years and years ago by a guy named James Buchanan. He is or was a Nobel Prize winning economist, used to teach at University of Virginia and then late, later in his career at George Mason University in um, Virginia. And he was a big proponent of, and a researcher, he kind of developed the field of public choice, which is the field of how do governments make decisions about policy and how do their self-interests influence the decisions in which they make. He was not a trade economist. But he was a market-oriented economist, and he gave this particular story. And he was asked to come to a conference about trade and talk about the advantages of free trade. And this was the story he was telling, kind of putting it in its very simplest context. And he said, this is, this is kind of why there's, there's fights about trade, why some people say we don't want to have open trade, because they're in import competing industries, and they're going to be negatively affected about, by that, and they are aware of that. But he says that what we need to do and think about it in terms of this particular story is to recognize that every individual in an economy, in a society, has two distinct roles that they play. The first role that maybe is most important to us as individuals is what we work at, what our business is, the industry through which we earn our income. We can think of that as our producer interest. So even though we may not be a firm owner, we work in a particular industry or a sector, we earn our income from that particular sector, and we care about the health and well-being of our firm in that particular sector. That's where our income is coming from. But all of us also have consumer interests. And our consumer interests tend to be very broad in comparison to our producer interests. Right? Our producer interest is narrow. We have one firm we work for in one industry. We care a lot about that. But in terms of our consumer interests, we have very broad interest because we consume housing and we consume electricity and gasoline and automobile services and transportation and on and on and on and on and on. We consume all of these different things. Now, Buchanan asks us to look at this in the context of discrimination and think to ourselves, what would be the very best outcome you or I could have as an individual thinking about our producer and consumer interests and competition or no competition? Well, the answer you could come up with is the following. In terms of our producer interests, the best way to secure a higher income for ourselves is to have a monopoly by the firm in which you happen to be employed and in which you work. Because that's going to generate the greatest amount of profit to the industry, more likely generate an increased income for you, especially if you're an owner of that firm, and you're going to make the most money possible if you have no competition in the industry in which you work. Monopolies are great then. But in terms of the goods in which you buy, the best outcome for you would be to have as much competition as possible for all of those goods, which means I, as an individual, would like to have as little competition in international trade education services as possible. 
because if there were no other international economists out there, I'd be the only one to go to, and I would earn a lot more, presumably, than I am now. Well, when it comes to the things that I purchase on a day-to-day -day basis, I would love to have competition in all of those individual industries so that the prices I pay for those products are, as, are pushed down as low as possible. That's going to maximize my own individual well-being. That's the best I can do. But the only way to achieve that outcome is to have a discriminatory policy. I have to favor my industry and make sure I hold on to a monopoly. And I have to make sure there's competition in all the other industries. Now, we jump to everybody else in the economy and recognize that, well, I'm in education services, I want a monopoly there, but somebody else is in healthcare, they want a monopoly in their firm. This person is over in the auto industry, they want a monopoly in their, everybody wants a monopoly in different industries, right? So your producer interest gets spread out across the economy, everybody's producing something else. But our consumer interests are very broad, all of us. So there is no way to secure this maximum return for everybody, certainly. And there's no way for me to secure a return like this unless we discriminate and make sure that my industry is protected and everybody else's is not. All right, so Buchanan says there's two outcomes, really, that involve no discrimination. And in terms of trade, it would work something like this. Trade enables competition. Because when you open up your borders to international trade, what you're basically doing is saying, we're going to allow open competition, and if foreign firms want to sell their products in our markets, they're welcome to do so. That's going to increase the competitiveness of certain industries, especially those firms who want to ship their products into our markets. And it's going to open up foreign markets to our producers to, to ship abroad. So trade opens up competition. If you want to prevent competition, give a monopolizing effect for your individual firms, the way to do that is put up barriers to trade. Protect your economy, close off the markets, put high taxes on imports, and so forth. So you could close off the economy and eliminate the competition. If we did that, if we could do that, that would raise the incomes of all of the people who work in the import competing industry. Assuredly, it would do that. So incomes and job security and all of that for all the people in the import competing industries would rise up if we simply restricted trade. Each individual in those industries would be better off, but it would also raise the prices of all of the goods that other individuals buy because the competition is being reduced. So all those import competing goods are all going to be higher priced. So in my industry, I might get a higher income, but I'm also going to have to pay a higher price for all of the other products that are being imported that I have to pay for. So one way to discriminate, or not discriminate equally, is to simply protect everybody's industry, close off all the markets to trade, and then we get higher incomes for all of us, but we also get higher prices for those imported goods. The second way to non-discriminate, not discriminate, is to have free trade, <coughs> have competition in all the industries. And if you have competition in all the industries, well, what's that's going to do the incomes of me in a, as an individual in a competitive industry? It's going to push my income down. It's going to mean my firm has to compete more head-to-head -head with other firms. It's going to have to make tougher decisions. It's going to have narrower profit margins. Everything is going to be tighter because of the competition. So there's going to be a little bit less security, and my income is going to be lower. Bad, right? It's going to be lower for everybody in the import competing industries, but the positive impact is going to be it's going to have lower prices for all of those other goods that I buy that I'm not in that industry. And that's the way to not discriminate. Either you protect everybody or you protect nobody. Now, Buchanan finally says, here's the argument in favor of free trade. First, don't discriminate. So the best, worst outcome you can have is to favor certain industries, not favor other industries, let these people get advantages of higher income, and let them enjoy lower prices because other industries are made competitive. That's just untenable. That's not fair at all. Don't discriminate. First rule. Then let society choose between closing yourself off to international trade completely to protect the incomes or opening up to free trade, let incomes fall, but enjoy the lower prices that come with it. So what Buchanan would ask is, which is better? What should society choose? Now, we actually have an answer for what the likely outcome of those two scenarios would be. Because it's the difference between, in the Ricardian model, 
autarky outcomes for Smith and Jones when they consume along their production possibility frontier in the interior versus specialization and the comparative advantage good and then trade with each other, that would be the free trade kind of an outcome. So what Buchanan would argue is, look, if we allow free trade, what we're achieving is, yes, lower incomes for all individuals, but a greater output. Increased efficiency, more output to go around for everybody, and lower prices for everybody to be able to enjoy and consume those, uh, those products. So yes, we have lower incomes, but we have lower prices that more than compensate for our lower incomes, and therefore we're going to be better off. And it's shown in our simpler model where we said that if Smith and Jones move to free trade, or if they move to specialization and trade with each other, we're going to get an increase in overall output and utility for both sides. That's what the free trade outcome would look like in a more complicated model. If you eliminate trade between countries, you're actually going to reduce total economic efficiency and people are going to be worse off as a result. So that becomes a different kind of argument to make. It recognizes the winners and losers that might arise because of opening up to trade, but it makes a argument in favor of free trade on a slightly different basis. Okay, now, there's one last aspect of this that I want to highlight. And that is why this gives us winners and losers. And the Ricardian model, which we did before, didn't give us winners and losers. There's another version of the Ricardian model, which we're not going to work our way through, but we would if we had more time. And it's called an immobile factor model. Suppose we have a diagram with oranges on one axis, QO, and apples on the other axis, QA. And we imagine an individual like Smith, whoops, where do we want to go, right here? Okay, we imagine an individual like Smith who can produce some combination of apples in total, some combination of, or some amount of oranges, and some combination in between. So this is the PPF. And we could imagine that this is maybe not Smith, but this is a country like the United States. And the United States could move all its workers into orange production and produce this many oranges, or it could move its workers into apple production and produce that many apples. So the movement along the PPF represents an adjustment of work, the workforce between the two industries. To move down to the right along this PPF, you're going to have to move workers out of apple production and into orange production. Now, the Ricardian model and the results that we get that everyone benefits is based on the fact that we start out in autarky at some point in the middle, and then in moving to open free trade with the rest of the world, we move our way down to a point like this, a specialization point, where we specialize in the good in which we have a comparative advantage. For a country, what that means is we move all the people out of the apple industry, let's say, <coughs> and into the orange industry, and everybody becomes an orange producer instead. The model, in other words, assumes what we would call factor mobility. The workers can move from one industry to another. And if you say, well, how long does that take? How much does it cost to do that? The answer is infinite amount of time. It happens inst instantly, and there are zero costs. It's not inconvenient whatsoever. You just call up the workers, say, don't go there tomorrow, go here instead, you're going to produce oranges. Everybody's fine with that. Now, real world has some frictions, has some difficulty with moving workers out of one industry and into another industry. Oftentimes, the skills that you need to work in one industry are not the same as the skills you need to be productive in another industry. So if you lose your job in industry A, you might not have an offer for a job in industry B very quickly because you might not have the right skill set. For a lot of reasons like that and other reasons that are outlined in chapter chapter 18, factors are often have difficulty moving from one industry to another. We call it factor immobility. Now, the model that we can construct which is an offshoot of the Ricardian model of comparative advantage that we did, sort of starts from a particular point like this and says, suppose we have a cer certain fixed number of orange workers and we can produce Q bar worth of oranges. And we can't produce any more or any less unless we lay workers off. We've got orange workers, they know how to produce oranges, nothing more. And we've got a bunch of apple producers, they can produce apples and nothing more, Q A bar, let's say. And let's start with an assumption of production where we're fixed 
in a particular production arrangement, and there's no way to move the workers from one industry to another. All right, now, if we took that model and we worked our way through the Ricardian comparative advantage story like we had told before, we're not going to do it here, I'm just going to tell you what the result is. What we discover in that model is that when two countries open up to trade with each other, and you can't move the workers between industries, thus you can't specialize in a so-called comparative advantage good because there isn't one, then import competing workers lose, export workers gain, and there's a redistribution of income between the two groups as a result of the opening up of trade. In other words, impose factor immobility and we get winners and losers as a result of trade. Now, go back to this model where we introduce Kim into the mix of things. And what we're discovering as a result of this outcome, Kim enters the market, Smith becomes better off. Well, if Smith is becoming better off, we're eliminating one possibility from the story, and that is, well, if Jones is losing money now relative to last month or last week or last yesterday because of Kim's presence, why doesn't he just move into the orange industry instead where greater profits and greater returns are likely to be? Well, I didn't introduce that to the story. And by not introducing it, it means I have imposed factor immobility. I'm saying you're either an apple grower or nothing. You're an orange grower or nothing. You can't move between the two industries. It turns out that factor mobility plays a big role in terms of who gains and who loses as a result of the opening up of international trade. Now, workers can be immobile to different degrees between industries. Some can move quickly. Like if you're an accountant in a particular sector in the economy and you, you lose your job, well, you can find an accounting job in some other sector. Now, there might be some specialized skills in doing the accounting for, say, the textile and apparel industry that you won't know or you, you know, that you, you don't need in another sector, like the financial sector. You might have different accounting skills you have to kind of hone. But you can maybe pick that up pretty quickly as long as you've got the basics, and you could move from one industry to another fairly easily. But if you're a more specialized worker, if you're a technical worker, or if you're an unskilled worker that's learned certain tasks in a particular sector, you may not be able to move quickly and easily over into another sector of the economy. You may not have matching skills. You're immovable or immobile. To the extent, then, that workers cannot transition from one industry to another in response to the opening up of trade, we're going to see more losers and more winners in the export industries as a result of that immobility. Mobility plays an important role in determining winners and losers then. It also then opens up a window for how you could motivate and explain why free trade could be good maybe in the aggregate, but also offer some sort of restitution to the people who might be injured as a result of trade. One way to do that, then, is to say, look, the problem is not trade. The problem is the immobility of the workers between industries. So open up to free trade. Have a TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and have freer trade. But recognize that <clears throat> some workers in some industries are going to be negatively affected as a result of that. So we might need a policy on the other side to try to deal with workers who have difficulty finding new jobs in other industries. Now, we have a provision in law which is called trade adjustment assistance. And trade adjustment assistance has been imposed and used since the 1960s to offer assistance to certain workers who are ups, upended, if you will, because of trade agreements or the expansion of international trade. What it does is gives them extended unemployment compensation, gives them some subsidies that can help them be used for training, to learn new skills, to allow them to transition more effectively into other industries. So that becomes an example of how we can take our simple models, recognize a particular friction like factor or labor immobility, see how it influences gains and losses in two different industries as a result of opening up to trade, and then use that to motivate a discussion about what you might want to do on the other end and a policy side if you're going to discuss reasonably what free trade you know, a free trade agreement with other countries. And it's a better approach, I would argue, 
than trying to kind of brute force say, no, I heard free trade is good for everybody. That's what economists always say. Free trade is good. It's always good. So why would you object to it? Well, there's lots of reasons to object, and we're going to see some more as we go forward. 